Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Web Delix Podcast, where we're on a journey to find out the truth about plant medicines, dislodge the myths, and change the narrative. I'm your host, Scott Mason, and with us today is our guest, Mark McNally. Mark, your career has been unusually rich and diverse. So I'm only going to be able to scratch the surface here, but let's start doing that scratching. You are currently the founder and chief nobody with Nobody Studios, a crowd-infused, high-velocity venture studio with a mission to build 100 impactful companies within the next five years. And before that, your first startup went public on the NASDAQ exchange in 1999, and you've since produced 14 startups that have raised over $300 million and seen over five billion in exits. I might add, none of this was even your first line of work. Because in addition to that, you were in an Army Special Ops unit for six years. It's a fascinating background. I can't wait to see how it all ties into psychedelics. We're gonna get that into a deeper discussion and, and roll up our sleeves and explore it all. In the, but in the meantime, Mark, I wanna say, welcome to the show. Scott, thank you, so glad to be here. Thank you. So as we talked about at the top of the hour, the purpose of this show is to find out the truth about psychedelics, especially for folks like me who are interested but don't necessarily understand everything about it and want to learn more. And we have a lot of scientists that we've been interviewing on the show, as well as subject matter experts, public policy people. But there's so much more to this than just the data. Right? Real people are using these things and they change human lives. And as we say throughout this show, there's a lot of mental health suffering in the United States going on right now. And this has a possibility to change lives. Now, I just read your bio and I am 100% sure that people watching or listening to this are going to say, this is a super successful business person who was in army special ops. What on earth would he have ever had in his life that would cause him to feel any empathy or concern for people who might have had PTSD or, or gone through any of this suffering? So maybe we could start, Mark, by going right into the heart of the matter. Why, from a personal perspective, does this subject matter to you? Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, I think uh, I'm like a lot of folks, at least I'll speak for myself, but I, I've gone through life hard charging alpha type male conquer the world the military background kind of teaches you to power through your suffering or don't be a whiner get back up on your feet power through things and you definitely need that muscle in the startup world <laughs> so you put up with high amounts of stress and adversity and you know fear and you know you kind of live with a hypertension for a career almost right and and some people are able to do that and i i was but you know, for me along the way, it started by having some very close friends go down. I saw very successful people go down with substance abuse or deep depression. I've lost a few folks to suicide along the way. And my need to solve things, that pissed me off because I was a very close part of a support system for a few people that were struggling like mightily. And I became incredibly disappointed with what the current system offers. The talk therapy world, I mean, I know amazing therapists and psychologists and psychiatrists, and they have all my love and respect, but trying to solve what I saw people going through just by sitting them in a room once an hour, once a week and talking through just, I knew it wasn't not the answer. And I've increasingly, this is not where I started my life, but I'm increasingly anti-pharmaceutical and believing that a lot of times we cause more damage than we cause good. And I just started this search of like, there's got to be a better way. And so that's the beginning of my, my path that led me to psychedelics because I was just researching what is the future? Like, what is the stuff people are saying? Is there a new kind of pharmaceutical? Is there a new kind of thing that's on the horizon? That was the beginning, it really stemming from my helplessness of watching people I cared about struggle. And then for me personally, not seeing it, it was like, it's like a baseball bat across the forehead. About four years ago, about a year and a half before I started Nobody, I just felt like I was hit across the forehead with a baseball bat. And I realized, I was not feeling myself. I wasn't getting out of bed the same way. Feelings that I was not accustomed to. And I say this with empathy because I know some people live throughout their life appreciating darker thoughts or struggling. That was something that was brand new to me. And it was literally like a moment where I was like looking at a different person, but it was debilitating for me. And for me to look into the, the abyss for the first time in my life scared the crap out of me. 
And there's a lot of things that got me out of it. There's a lot of love and family and support and friends, doctors, psychedelics played a massive role in me finally kind of setting myself free. But for me to come out of that and look back at that moment, like a memory, like the time you were in Greece or the time that you were in Tijuana or whatever, like to be able to look back at it as a memory, but it's still so sharp in my emotions. Like if I think of some of those moments that were some of my darkest, I can immediately viscerally feel it throughout my body. And that gave me this deep empathy because I was that person. I feel like I owe a lot of people apologies. I was a person who used to think early on that mental health was a weakness. Yeah. I mean, guilty. And for me to, to have gone through that and know how hard it was to get through gave me hope that anybody can get through, but it also gave me this deep empathy for how much people suffer and how trapped they may be. And look, I know I'm somebody who's been exposed to a lot of high-performance training and high-performance thinking and coaching. I have more resources than most people. And so for me to know how dark it was for me and how hard it was for me to get out, it left me with this deep empathy for the rest of the world that maybe isn't coming to the table with the same resources, the same thinking, or the same support systems. And so it made me really, really passionate that it shouldn't just be the people who are maybe as fortunate as I've had been to have those experiences that make it out. There's got to be a systematic, fundamentally different way we approach this problem. And as I got more and more passionate about that, the science, the history, the undebatable facts around psychedelics just made me very passionate that I had to be a part of bringing this to the masses. First of all, I want to thank you for the passion with which you shared that story. There was a lot in it. And I'm going to take a couple of seconds, roll back a little bit, maybe get some details about it. But there was a lot that you shared. Before we say anything, I have to say, throughout this show, when it comes to the mental health system, talk therapy has come up as a dominant modality for people dealing with a lot of the traumas that we face day to day. I was in talk therapy, I've mentioned this elsewhere in other episodes, for 11 years to deal with PTSD that I went through. And I share your hats off to those therapists that changed my life and were patient enough to listen to me for 11 years. What the heck? I was talking about half the time. But that being said, they were there for me. But you're right. I mean, 11 years for me or for a long time may not be enough or it may not be the sort of intense, provide the intensity of the intervention that someone needs. When you were talking earlier about your career, the people that you knew that had begun to walk into the abyss before you yourself experienced it, were those folks that you knew in the military or were those that were people that you knew in the business world? And talk to me, where is there any difference between those two? For those of us that might not have been in the military, for instance. I'm not sure. It was for me much later in my life that I appreciated that I had combat PTSD. And it was something that I didn't rely on the VA system at all when I left the service. And it wasn't until I realized that I had some some kind of deep-seated memories and traumas, and I couldn't get the help from the regular talk therapist that I actually reached out to the VA because they know this stuff, right? And again, credit to all the doctors and people who are in that system. But I will say in that particular case, what I found the most healing was interacting with other people who understood me because not a lot of people could understand some of the things you go through. Right. And that was something that was really transcendent because some of the folks that impacted me the most might've been a 75 year old veteran from Vietnam. We don't have the same campaigns. We didn't use the same equipment. We, we were different units, but still the trauma at least was similar and we could talk about it the same way. But yeah, the folks along the way, you know, I think that um, one of the things I came to appreciate, and it certainly was something I saw with people I knew maybe before and after was that I started to sense deeply interacting with them that their mind wasn't working the same way that it used to. And so this feeling of like, wow, the power of the brain, when either your chemicals aren't working the right way inside, or you've created these hardwired kind of thinking, which is part of what psychedelics helps unwind. It's like you can become somebody else or the scary part about mental health is once you start to get in the darkness, the power you need to get out of it, it's not there. You can't summon it because of the darkness, right? <laughs> and so it becomes a self-fulfilling kind of spiral and it becomes tighter and tighter. And, you know, and I've dealt with someone, a very close loved one that uh, suddenly had really profound uh, paranoia. And paranoia is like, you know, aliens are coming to get us and the government runs everything. And if you say, hey, I want to get you help, now you're part of the problem. And you get in the spot where you're like so helpless because you can't mention anything. You can't try to help somebody without being part of the problem and being kicked out of their lives. And that's just such a horrible, helpless feeling. 
And it's the same feeling that you know families feel when they see somebody deep into an addiction or substance abuse problem. They just feel you're either in or out, and you either <laughs> you know give yourself the space for your own protection, or you you know absorb the bruises to be close enough to that person to try and help them. And both of those suck. And it just yeah, more and more I went through these, and then my own experience realizing how when I was in a you know looking into the abyss, the mind and the positivity that I had come to appreciate my entire life. Like sure, the sun's coming up in the morning. I could always count on that part of me to get me through anything. And when I realized it was gone, and I'm like fumbling around, lurking in my drawers and just reaching for it, and it was nowhere to be found, that was one of the most scariest moments of my life because I didn't know how to get myself out. So yeah, that for me, this it's really passionate that and the talk therapy is a piece of it, right? Don't get me wrong. But the problem is, and this is what I you know I've had great talks with therapists and you know psychologists and, and psychiatrists also like. One of the things that psychedelics is, is actually an energetic healing on a much deeper level. And when you walk into a talk therapy session, Tuesday at 4 p.m., <laughs> you're just trying to turn off all the shit that you just came out of, right? <laughs> yes. You're still in your egocentric mind world. Oh, yes. <laughs> you're still in your, oh, my God, after this, I got to go to the grocery store. I got to pick my kids. I got to do this. You're still in your, like, all the bullshit that doesn't matter world. And you're trying to solve deep-seated traumas. Yeah. And there's still this dynamic, I'm sorry, in that relationship where in most cases, you're talking to somebody with a bunch of diplomas on the back of the wall. And it's like, the implication is, I'm here to fix you because you're screwed up. Let's talk. Do you see what a badass I am? And that creates a dynamic also that is stops the flow and pumps up the ego. And you still carry your facade, right? One of the problems we have in life is we carry walk through life with our traumas. And we wrap it with a facade to make it look pretty. How many people do you know that are posting pictures of them and their husband on Facebook clinking wine on a sunset on the beach, and then you know they're going to divorce, right? It's like we do this, and I say all that because people know it's true when they hear it. <laughs> That's why I'm laughing. <laughs> and the only thing I know that dissolves the ego truly puts you on a different energetic level to see the roots of the trauma and realize how petty like truly petty, most of the things we carry through our life are, and at least see it for what it is. We're like, oh yeah, I know why that was a trauma. I know it hurt me. I validate that that's okay to be hurt, but it has no purpose in my life anymore. Throw it over the boat. I'm moving on in life. And if people could do that in a profound way, that's kind of what talk therapy is trying to do. But you'll hear this a lot as you do the podcast. You'll hear people say a well-guided psychedelic ceremony with a good shaman with intention setting leading up to it, you know, a good month or so before, they'll say one good ceremony is like five years of talk therapy. And I would say it's more like 10. And I really, truly, truly believe that as I've gone deeper into my journey, as I've introduced it to other people, it's just a profound power it has for us to heal more rapidly than we ever could in other ways. And I have to say this, again, as usual, there's a lot in that we could have a conversation all night and into tomorrow over a lot of what you said. And man, who knows, we may have you back on additional episodes and talk <laughs> about those things. But that being said, you're not the first person on the podcast that has said this. And I'm thinking I was in talk therapy 11 years, right? A good session that would have saved me 10 years of making mistakes. And what you're saying also about the ego in therapy. First of all, it took me forever to get to therapy because of my ego. I didn't want to be seen or see myself as someone. And then, yeah, the diplomas and everything. I want to make sure that I'm a pure and all respectable and I'm not having the therapist think I'm crazy. Even though I'm thinking things that are crazy, that's totally real. When you use words, though, like energetic healing modality, or I mean, those weren't the exact words that you use, but that sort of language. For someone like me that was very tactile, very right angle and line sort of thinking at that era in my life. Can you explain a little bit more about what that means? Yeah, and I, I was the same way. And before I got into psychedelics, I got exposed to energetic healing, which you can do without psychedelics, right? And as introduced to actually my wife mentioned to me when we were just starting to date. And she'd had a profound experience where a very powerful energetic healer had physically and emotionally impacted her body, brought her to tears, all these other things without touching her, right? Wow. And I was skeptic. You know, I'm like, yeah, I can just, what's the trick here? You know, I've, we would have spoken the same language. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's the trick here? Did he <laughs> spray something on you? Like, I'm trying to figure it out. I also pride myself on being open minded. And it's one of the things that I try to build into Nobody Studios today, which is we never have the answer. You know, I love what Socrates said in 100 people sense. The more I know, the more I realize what I don't know. Right. And so I said, look, I'm going to go into open minded. And I had an experience with this healer and it was, 
undeniably profound, rewarding and healing path over the years. So it started to make me understand that we're all connected in a bigger way. And it's not unlike watching Avatar you know, and watching the experience you go through as a dumb Marine, realizing, wait, the plants are connected to the butterflies, to the animals. And it puts off a lot of people. It would have put me off 12 years ago or 15 years ago, right? But you don't have to understand it intellectually or conceptually. When you have a psychedelic experience, you understand it this viscerally. You feel it in a way that you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, wow. Like if I said, you know, people should talk about near-death experiences and they see the light, you know, you hear people talk about that, yeah. right? It's not like that. It is that. Not with the near-death experience, but it's a connecting to the, all the layers that are all around us in ways that we don't feel and understand walking through our physical days. Well, but then as someone who may have been facing this existential abyss or this depression, when you were at the height of your success and feeling this state of depression, how did you feel before you were in psychedelic therapy and how did you feel in comparison afterwards so that outside of having this revelatory experience what was it like for you day to day after you had begun to engage in this that had changed from before so if i'm thinking about this and wanting to say well okay what does it do for me every day because i'm too depressed to go to work what does that look like for those that are listening, I, I'll for, forgive me for being simplifying, right? But I'll simplify for most viewers just to get their head around it. I believe that depression and these really dark moments that you'll feel, for the most part, it is attached to hopelessness. It's attached to feeling that the current circumstances you're in are not what you want or may not be worth living on for, right? And then they're usually locked in by limiting beliefs that say, and I can't change any of that. Yeah. So when you feel like you're in a spot that's not good for you, not healthy, you don't want to go on if that's as dark as you are or somewhere along that spectrum, and you feel like you can't do anything about it, that's where people get into a spiral. And the reality is, you know, talk therapy or a good friend could help you maybe eventually realize, no, that's all bullshit. You could change it all, right? <laughs> but it's really, really hard to get there. There are people who maybe feel like because they're trapped in a marriage, they don't love, but they feel like if they left their wife, their kids wouldn't forgive them, but they got to keep a job they hate because they got to pay the mortgage. Yeah. And then they, it's harder and harder to wake up every morning. You know, I've tried to tell a few friends along the way, like sell it all, shave your head, move to Costa Rica, come out of the closet. Like your whole life can be different. Like whatever is inside of you, like it's all possible before leaving this earth. Why not try something different? But the reality of it is most people their own ego is so wrapped up in their current situation and their commitments and their perceptions of other people and the judgments that not being on this earth is easier than thinking of going through the judgments of their circle, their friends, or family of moving to Costa Rica and shaving their head, right? And I just, those, those traps, those hopelessnesses, that's actually what makes most people go down in my simplified version of it, right? Psychedelics make you see how trivial and silly most of those trappings we think we're living in are. And you're able to see things like, wait, my relationship with my kids is way deeper than anything. And me being happy above all is the most important thing. And that bill or that mortgage or that private school, none of that means shit. That job, my resume on LinkedIn, none of that means shit. What matters is me getting to my best spot where I can impact the world the way I was intended to. And when you connect at the energetic level, the way I can describe it is you see the, the silliness of what we go through every day. And what we think is so important. And you're like, okay, what did you do today? What did you do this week? And you had to summarize it. You're like, well, I drove to Little League 14 times. I went back in school, back and forth from school 42 times. I paid these 18 bills. I did my 40 hours at work. And at the end of the day, you're like, and that's what you're here on this planet to do, right? And everybody's got a different psychedelic experience. For me, I can say it'd be profoundly attached to me to my vision of the future. And I was able to see a future state of things five to 10, 20 years from now. Not as a dream, like, oh, that would be really cool, but like a for sure, this is the path. If you make this the priority, this is given to you. This is going to be afforded to you. Your ability to have this impact on these people, your ability to be this person, it is a sure thing if you seize it. That, in my ears, is literally being given the key to unlock the chains that are keeping you in the underworld. And isn't that the opposite of hopelessness? It is. It's the opposite of hopelessness because you... And you feel, when I say energetic, and some people refer to it as this diet, you know, diety feeling, like you're, you're definitely connecting to a different level, but it's something that's so visceral in your heart and your mind 
that I was given every time I, I do a ceremony and I microdose now, a microdosing it keeps me connected to that feeling without being in a psychotic state, you know, psychedelic state. But it's like I'm always connected to the true path. And I'm still human and I can get wrapped up in my days and the trivial stuff. But when I'm aware of it, it only takes me one second, like literally 30 seconds for me to take a deep breath, reconnect to the energetic level and realize the path I'm really on. And the stuff that was getting me wound up just dissolves to the floor. And isn't that kind of magic you'd want to offer everybody you know struggling? (laughs) Well, and by framing it that way, it really does go as to why this would be either an addition to or an alternative to talk therapy because getting to that place, look, when you're in a depressive state, I don't know about you, but going to your theme of hopelessness, you can get so cynical that even the idea of something getting better seems ludicrous. And so we're literally being able to unshackle yourself from that darkness and even being able to see a pinpoint of light, let alone being able to see with certainty things like purpose, which really do bring us something we're being excited about in this world, powerful stuff. But I've got to ask hearing this, you said earlier that you have some cynicism about the pharmaceutical industry. And hey, I don't think anyone listening to this is not cynical about that. But what would you answer to those who say, well, okay, all this is is just a different type of pharmaceutical? Yeah, well, I first I'd answer that this is plant medicine. It's organic. It's not (laughs) man-made. And sometimes find myself saying this is the future of mental health, substance abuse. There's a lot of studies coming out that it's the future of pain management, you know, end of life. There's so many different areas that psychedelics really can transform, you know, some of the, the hardest things we're struggling with right now in the world. And we don't have like even a good possible competitor, right? Opioid addiction is a pharmaceutical. Like, how are you going to give a pharmaceutical to cause a problem the pharmaceutical cause, right? Yeah. You know, I think I, I've always been somebody that if the doctor said, take this medicine, it's going to make you better. I didn't think twice. I filled it, whatever. Yeah. But it was usually like an illness for a week or two weeks or whatever, right? But when I found myself in not in a, you know, the great spot four years ago and I started going to doctors and people started writing prescriptions like they're handing out popcorn. The day I decided to throw it all away, I woke up and had 14 prescriptions in the, in the cabinet. And I was like, none of these fuckers are talking to each other. Whoa. And that's not me. And it's not making me feel any better. So I had to go back to this organic where I'm like, I'm going to get myself healthy. I'm going to get my mind healthy. And so the only thing that made sense to me was something that was organic. And I laugh when I say it's the future of mental health because it's also the past. Yeah. You know, indigenous cultures have been using plant medicine for thousands of years. You know, this is something that is known to humankind. It just got lost in our Western medicine mentality, right? And it's just coming full circle. And in reality, in the 60s, combined with modern medicine, you know, Timothy O'Leary and Ram Dass and some of these really groundbreakers, you know, they got lumped together with the counterculture. But they were saying things in the 60s. You'll see statements from Timothy O'Leary saying, undoubtedly, psychedelics is the future of mental health. Psychedelics is the future of substance abuse treatment. And yeah, they were using it to expand their mind and solve the world's problems and all kinds of things. And it served the government at the time. We all know the failure of the war on drugs, right? That that got lumped into the war on drugs. And it also happened to represent a counterculture movement that was kind of anti-government and anti-war. And so it served the politics of the time to lump it in there. And unfortunately, that buried 50 years of research that could have happened. You know, it's only been in the last five to 10 years that you know, universities have started researching it again and getting licenses and you know laboratories and start exploring what these molecules really do to the brain. And it's profound and it's unarguable. So I'm excited that it's so many different derivatives of this are going to come into the market and really save and and help a lot of people. And I'm just excited to be a part of explaining to people and helping people understand it. I am too. And and I thank you for that. I've got to ask one question because I know everyone listening to this or watching it will ask this. Are those 14 prescriptions still there or has the psychedelic use? I don't take anything right now. I think I take a blood pressure medicine. That's it. That's a statement. And I'm not saying I took those 14 every day. I'm just saying... I filled them like I was supposed to, put them in the cabinet. And one day I opened it, I'm like, these people are freaking crazy. I'm not going to take any of these. But you know, Mark, it really does. I I say this because, and maybe you weren't taking them all at the same time, but there was a period in my life when I was taking, and they weren't necessarily mental health related, but they were other pharmaceuticals. I had on my desk at work when I was refilling, calling up back in that time to get the prescription renewal, I had like nine on my desk. And one of my staff members came in, looked at my desk and looked at me. I could see this look of horror in her face. And taking control of my future and looking at alternative non-pharmaceutical ways to deal with the health problems that I had, 
I'm not doing anything now. So I have to take that seriously. And I think that people who might be listening to this or watching this who have someone they care about, who might have 9, 10, 15, 20 prescriptions, they may hear this. I'm someone who always like, likes to understand the thesis behind things. So when someone's doing something, I want to say, well, what was your rationale? Yeah. Okay, let's figure out if that's working. And so I tend to do that now with you know, second, or pharmaceuticals. So you look at some of these things, and right off the bat, you're like, this is just dumb. And this is not about me. Are you looking at things that people were taking, right? So you get into the root of like antidepressants and stuff. You know, SSRIs are you know, kind of the leading thing. People are in deep, deep, dark, depressive states. You know how long SSRIs take to kick in? Three months. That's the best we have to offer? Okay, let's take another example. People who are dealing with substance abuse. One of the leading medicines they prescribe is something that turns off the pleasure centers in your body. So therefore, you're not getting the pleasure from your addiction, right? I mean, it kind of makes sense. But wait, let me get this straight. Somebody is already depressed, and they're self-medicating to try and get some pleasure to get through life. And you're going to just turn that off completely. So now they're not even going to get it in other ways. And they're also somebody who's in an addictive state needs immediate gratification. Like, this just to me feels like putting fuel on fire, right? And so I'm not saying they can't help certain people, but the general thesis of some of these are just flawed. You know, they really are not helping the person heal and get back to a happy state. They're just trying to manage symptoms versus getting to the core. And if you are really into that spot because of a lot of traumas, it could be childhood or it could be way earlier in your life. The best way to give somebody a reset in life is to dissolve the traumas, right? So much of the discussion that we have had throughout the season of the show has been, by the way, around reframing assumptions that we have about a whole host of issues that touch on this issue. And one of the things that's been great about everything that you shared so far is not only your own realness, but you shared challenges to some of these assumptions. Even here as a host of the show, listening and watching you, I didn't even realize I had. If you are someone that is touched by this story, by what you shared so far, and I am, and you have one piece of advice for them, because this is speaking to them, what might that piece of advice be, Mark? I would say for me that the medicine itself was part of it, but if you want to get the energetic healing and you really want to get the rest of that to be the aura that you come out away with, that finding an experienced guide in the space is critical. I've got a fantastic shamanic ally. I've introduced him to four or five people who are interested in pursuing plant medicine. He's only taken two of them on because he's told me the others weren't ready or they needed to go through some work to be ready. And I think you need to see it with that sacredness because the plant medicine He'll say, and others will say, responds to what you vibe. It's not magic. It doesn't say, this is a sick person. I'm going to make you healthy. What it does is it understands what you're trying to accomplish and it makes that true. So if you come in with a chaotic mind and you come in with a you know, not a clear intention and that intent or that intention's unhealthy, you're going to get that. And so that's where you, if you're here as somebody having a bad experience, it's usually because I believe they pursue it from almost like a party drug mentality. Like, hey, I'm going to pop this magic medicine and I'm going to feel good. Like, I've, I've never done that in my life. I won't. It's not what I recommend. I, I'm not a part of that. That's not what I advocate for. But if you're with somebody who can explain to you the true intention, the sacredness of the medicine, the ceremony and the process that goes around it, and having a powerful experience, it can be life-changing. And, and this is a thing you'll, see, you'll hear again and again on your podcast. But it's profound when you look at the research that people will say their psychedelic ceremony, like I just described, consistently ranks in a top one, two, or three life memory up there with childbirth and marriage. Wow. And that's why you'll hear folks like me so passionate about it. Because when you have that moment, that one of your biggest moments of your life, you want to tell people about it, especially if you found it healing and especially if you see people around that could benefit from it. Again, a lot to think about, a lot to mull over, a lot to feel. Mark, with the passion and the power that you have shared your story with, I cannot imagine that people listening to or watching this episode are not going to want to find out more about you. Where can they go? Oh yeah, look, I mean, I'm an open book, so you know, I'm, uh, reach out to me, Mark at nobodystudios.com. You can catch me on LinkedIn. I love dialogue, I love learning, and I love sharing, so. Mark, it's been great having you on the show today. Thank you so much for joining us for sharing your wisdom and your story. For those of you listening or watching, if you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a review or a comment and tell the folks that you care about everything that we're doing. And don't forget to follow WebDelix on our social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter, 
Facebook, LinkedIn, as well as TikTok. And be sure to check out our website at webdelix.com. That's W E B D E L I C S.com. And sign up for our blog to get the most trusted educational information about plant medicine and psychedelics on the web. Then join us next time for another episode of the Webdelix podcast.